ValveTime.net. Hi, and welcome to the Valve Time News for June 1st, 2016, where we'll recap all the latest news regarding Valve and the community. While it's not uncommon for Valve to be targeted with lawsuits of all shapes and sizes, it's very rare for them to be legally targeted by anything other than another large company or organization. This is at least partially why it was such a big shock to hear of a new legal case against Valve for $3.1 million. Beginning back in April 2016, the case was filed following the firing of an unnamed member of Valve's staff, who was reportedly let go following gender reassignment surgery in 2012. Part of the surgery and recovery procedure forced the employee to move to Los Angeles, California, away from Valve HQ, sacrificing their status as a full-time employee in the process, instead being referred to as an independent contractor. Later, following the completion of the surgery, the employee apparently filed a complaint about Valve's Steam Translation program, which they believed exploited talented, usually young, people into translating Steam's content for little or no reward. Several days later, the contractor was reportedly fired, with their supervisor having also referred to them as it, rather than any other more polite pronoun. Apparently, this particular case is actually just a part of an even bigger legal strike at Valve by apparently abused translators, many of whom are seeking damages for other reasons, though the gaming media hasn't shed any light on these other issues over the past week. Why it took the unnamed party four years to take legal action against Valve is unknown, but these things tend to be a lot more complicated than they seem on the surface. In our humble, not remotely legally trained opinions, we think the request for $3 million in damages from Valve is absolutely ludicrous, especially given that legal cases of this kind almost always boil down to finger pointing. That isn't to say Valve or their employees are right or wrong in this scenario, just that we think over $3 million is a tad much. It'll likely be a while before we see any kind of resolution whatsoever, but it's definitely a case many will be following closely. Here's hoping we get to see Valve's side of the story at some point. Although there wasn't much in the way of game-changing news for any of Valve's major titles this past week, Dota 2 did receive an interesting update which has likely sailed over many players' heads. On Monday, Valve quietly added Vulkan support to Dota 2. Vulkan is a high-end graphics API they've been talking about introducing for over a year. Developed by the Kronos Group, Vulkan is designed as an alternative to the likes of OpenGL, offering high performance and lower CPU usage. Theoretically, or at least eventually, Vulkan should be able to provide solid if not better performance for some players than the alternatives they have been stuck with until now. To enable Vulkan as Dota 2's default graphics API, simply opt into the Steam client beta, enable the Vulkan downloadable content icon in Dota 2's properties, then add dash Vulkan to the game's launch options. We've personally found using Vulkan to be a little buggy so far, with weird graphical issues and a few messed up HUDs, but it is a beta after all. For now, it's probably best to avoid the beta if you aren't interested in seeing the odd graphical glitch or hiccup, so just hang on a little while longer for Valve to fully roll out the functionality before you jump in. You're not really missing out on all that much. One other game-related update released this past week focused instead on Team Fortress 2, bringing automatic demo recording functionality. As what we imagine to be one of the most highly requested features from YouTubers and streamers, this new tool, once set to automatic, saves a demo file of an entire match alongside various other files which give details on killstreaks and important events, allowing for easy reviewing. This allows any player to quickly and easily review their game footage without having to rely on a server or third-party gameplay capture, something which is definitely long overdue for TF2's core audience. Numerous other miscellaneous item tweaks and security changes were also made, although few details were given. For a closer look at all of these changes and those related to the demo system, check out the full change log over on the TF2 blog. Oddly, there hasn't been any real news out of Valve about their virtual reality pursuits after the official launch of the HTC Vive around a month and a half ago. While that still didn't change this past week, Valve's Alan Yates, also known as one of the key figures behind the design and functionality of the base station, did have something to say regarding the Vive and its competitor, the Oculus Rift. In a thread over on the Vive subreddit, Alan chimed in to reveal that the architecture for the Oculus CV1, also known as the Retail Rift, is largely a direct copy of a 1080p Steam Sight prototype lent to Oculus by Valve several years back. At the time, Valve and Oculus likely weren't competitors, with the Steam site acting as the in-development precursor to the Vive, which explains why Valve were more than happy to install a VR room at Oculus headquarters. 
Alan, who is without a doubt one of the most senior authorities when it comes to the Vive, claims the only real differences between the Rift and Vive are Oculus's own CV-based tracking system and their Fresnel lens design. He then concludes by saying he would call Oculus the first Steam VR licensee, essentially beating HTC to that position, before remarking that history likely won't remember it that way. It's not obvious at this point if Alan is simply throwing shade at their now competitor Oculus, who actually hired much of Valve's hardware staff at one point, or if Oculus' design for the Rift is just that much of a copycat, but it's a fun tidbit of information nonetheless. With remote-controlled drones becoming all the more prominent as a pastime, it was only a matter of time before someone went ahead and started creating working, one-to-one -one scale replicas of the numerous hovering devices seen throughout Half-Life 2. This past week, YouTube user Valplushka introduced the world to his very own city scanner, shown here. It's an impressive build, to say the least, with the drone featuring numerous LEDs and a functioning, shifting faceplate. The illusion is mostly seamless, with the larger frame of the city scanner almost completely masking the drone propellers underneath. It's also far bigger than it looks at first glance. Valplushka's plans to create the city scanner were first laid out in a separate, much less popular video back in March, but it's great to finally see the real deal out and about doing what it does best, which is to say, spying on people. And that dystopian note brings us to the end of another week of Valve News. Don't forget to follow our social media pages, to check out our previous content, and to join in with the discussions over on the valvetime.net community forums. Thanks for watching and bye for now!